a lot of times we call freelancing or independent artistry entrepreneurship. Yeah. There is no infrastructure. There is no sustainability. S- solopreneurship. Exactly. Yeah, it's much, much different. Right. And it, and it's not something that can actually empower people always, sometimes. Mm. But being a freelancer doesn't necessarily empower the same opportunities that entrepreneurship does. Right. If you are able to monetize your mission or profit from your passion or really create commerce around the things that you love. Mm-hmm. And I'm always shouting from the rooftops that if more people had the privilege and luxury to do what they love, if not world peace, we would at least have happier colleagues. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Travis Makes Friends. Today, I am making friends with Elisa Jacobs. Elisa, what's up? Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I believe the first time that we met was at an event, a mastermind event, a mastermind Mm -hmm. that I'm in, and a mastermind that you spoke at with uh, Dan Fleischman in uh, Miami, I think it was. Yeah. Um, And then, so from there, I started following some of the stuff that you're working on and was like, man, there's really, really cool things that she's doing. And then we randomly bumped into each other again uh, a couple months ago at uh, the Pump Foundation Mm -hmm. uh, Gala. And so I was like, hey, well, we should should do an episode together sometime. So now here we are. Um, Thanks for having us hosting um, in in, uh, uh, Beverly Hills area right now. And so I want to go back in time here, set the scene for people listening or watching who may not know who you are. Um, and really go through the entire story here. So let's say 11-year-old Elisa Jacobs. Mm. Set the scene. What was life like for you? Where were you? All that good stuff. Man, she was a pisser. Um, (laughs) 11-year-old Elisa actually was on to her third company. (laughs) Um, I probably made more money between like 9 and 15 than most of my 20s. Um, wow, no way. Yeah. I what was, was the first company? So I was kind of a serial entrepreneur really, really young. And my parents were hippies that were like, yeah, yeah, do whatever you want. Dress yourself, right? Hmm. And I don't think they realized how much money I was making because it seemed like fun, odd jobs, slightly elevated from a lemonade stand, which I basically franchised so I didn't have to do any of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> with like different price points, depending on like how saturated the lemonade was. That's hilarious. Um, but yeah, the first company, what was the first company? The first company was a card company. Okay. And I saved up my allowance, which was not very big, yeah. to buy Print Shop Deluxe. I don't know if you remember this, where Mm-mm. you could like create your own greeting cards, basically. And they were okay. like these little like quadrant four folded things. And I, so I bought, <laughs> I bought Print Shop Deluxe and I thought I was going to be Hallmark. So I came up with all these birthdays, milestones, um, captions, yeah. quotables, right? Three inch binder. And went and hawked them to all my neighbors. But when you're a cute little kid yeah, and you're bringing on-demand portable solutions on an annual basis for all these different holidays, people buy them. Yeah, And I was selling them for a premium. And so I would sell like for like two bucks a pop these yeah. homemade greeting cards. Yeah. But I would package them. So I'd be like, or you can get them for the low, low price of whatever. <laughs> For 20 for the holidays or wild card for this number of birthdays as long as, you know, whatever. So that was the first one. It was called Dare to Dream Cards Incorporated. Nice. My mom still has the binder in the back actually says a limited liability corporation by Elisa Jacobs. And there was like no internet, by the way. So she's like, I didn't know what that meant. I have no idea who taught you what an LLC was at like eight. But you spelled it right. (laughs) That's funny. There's that. I had a jewelry company. Um taught myself how to make and no entrepreneurship from your parents at all so i wouldn't say entrepreneurship my grandfather was an entrepreneur he was actually first the head of pr for shell oil and gas for like 12 years after the coast guard after being a thespian after living a lot of lives yeah yeah um and when he left he started um an ambulance medical device company that was one of the first to basically uh rent equipment, which was a solution with impact because in the medical field, they were not able to get to like the emergencies quickly enough Mm. because there wasn't enough trucks basically. Um, so he was very um, entrepreneurial and enterprising, but yeah, my mom was, you know, a respiratory therapist that became a college professor in allied health. And my dad, um, was in foster care and social work my whole life and the CEO of a nonprofit. So he was working with a lot of like immigrant families and at-risk youth and okay. social work. Okay. So they were always very um, socially entrepreneurial, but they weren't 
like starting businesses. Like yeah, 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 sure, sure. So it was literally just a bl- in your blood thing. Like, you, like you don't remember yeah. ever seeing somebody doing this and going like, I want to do that. It was just more like, I like to make money and it's come so up with ideas. I actually love that question because I don't know the answer. Mm. Um, I always thought it was my parents because they are so encouraging and sure. loving and empowering. Um, but I remember going back during quarantine and I, so two things happened. But going back, so where's that? Sorry, Massachusetts. Okay. So okay. I was living in New York. Um, I lived here in LA for almost eight years. I moved to New York um, to lead culture and partnerships at Diageo, which is like a 20 something billion dollar beverage alcohol company. Okay. So it was like Ciroc, Don Julio, De Leon, a lot of celebrity and partnerships, et cetera. So I moved there, was there about six and a half years. And then during quarantine, went back to visit my parents for a couple of months and paid for a very overpriced storage unit in New York, Manhattan. <laughs> Um, <laughs> more expensive certain, than most apartments. Yeah. I mean, when you're not living in it, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> adds up quick. Yeah. Um, but I remember I found this box and this is not a direct answer, but you'll understand why I'm telling you. I found this box of books cause I'm a super nerd and I love reading. I still love reading. I like physical books. Okay. I've never had a Kindle. I've never listened to an audio book. I aspire to, but I, I like touching and feeling and yeah. highlighting and, you know, And so there was these books and they were global folklore. It was like Chicano literature and Nigerian and um, Chinese and Cherokee and like literally folklore and fables from around the world. Mm. And I remember going over to my mom and being like, this is why I'm how I am. What were you guys feeding me and reading me? (laughs) That's so interesting. And she looked at me like I was crazy and was like, I know you're not giving me credit for you being a crazy kid. (laughs) And I was like, what do you mean? Why would I know what any of these cultures are, much less have interest in them? Yeah. She was like, I will never know. But when you would get a reward, you were allowed to pick a book from the bookstore. At the time, it was Barnes & Noble or Borders or whatever. Yeah. And she's like, you would find parts of the bookstore we didn't know existed. Like categories that we didn't even know there were aisles for. Yeah. And she's like, you were just always like this. And I asked her about the entrepreneurship because it wasn't just entrepreneurial in the sense of like, you know, doing newspapers, which I also did, or literally franchising the three cul-de-sacs in a row for lemonade, lemonade stands, stands. Um, <laughs> and water on the side of the road on like the main drag in between the three streets in case no one came down, like really geographic targeting. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it was teaching myself new skills. And yeah. so I didn't know how to do copywriting, but I was really creative and I liked art and drawing. And so designing these cards and, and t- coming up with witty, you know, I don't yeah, know what that's sayings really called. or yeah, yeah, yeah. Like greetings <clears throat> was, mm-hmm. was really fun. I didn't know how to make jewelry. I literally taught myself with like needle nose pliers and wires and yeah, yeah. Got one of those plastic bins with compartments. Oh and yeah. Beads. Yep. Um, and then with, uh, est- basically estate sales. I, uh, I called it, um, like yard sales, but it really wasn't. I would go to the neighbors and find out like what they had, they didn't want mm. and not ask for any fees. I'd ask, what do you want to get for this? And so they would price everything that they were willing to get rid of. And again, at seven years old, eight years old, 11 years old, you're cute and enterprising yeah, and, right, right. and gregarious. Right. And they're like, yeah. I'll and you're going to get rid of this junk in my house for me. So I'd yeah. upcharge 20%, <laughs> yeah. whatever they wanted. And then anything that didn't sell, there was like a junk haul for like charity. Yeah. And so I would also take the onus of donating anything that didn't sell. But I made a killing because there was like 15 houses per block on the three cul-de-sac streets in a row I was allowed to ride my bike to. Yeah. Which at this point, by 11 or 12, I had bought a mongoose stunt bike with no brakes. And my mom was not The mongoose. Bike. Remember the mongoose? Yeah. Yeah. And it had, um, and then I bought the little pink <laughs> basket to go with my boy's BMX bike <laughs> to carry my uh, binder around <laughs> with my bell. So I was a bit of a, oh, a bit of a vision at 11. But That's really fun. Yeah, I made, I mean, I started a college fund. Do you have any siblings? I have an older sister. Did she do anything similar? Sarah is, no, she did okay. not. Um, she was in student council, vice president of her class, four and a half years older, Okay. Um, played volleyball, she was much more rebellious than me. And oh, really? so okay. I don't know what she was up to because she wasn't around much. Yeah. But um, in honesty, like, I think a lot of the things I did were for her attention. Mm. And so at four or five years younger, I had parents that, you know, they met, were engaged two months later, married six months later, and have been married for almost 47 years. Mm. And 
they're very liberal. They're very entrepreneurial in the sense of like social impact Mm -hmm. and very like, do what do you, right? So I was never really seeking their approval because that was like a given. That was the biggest form of luxury or privilege you can have, right? Mm -hmm. My sister, on the other hand, I was like, love me, need me, be my friend. <laughs> yeah, right. She used to call me Ducky. Do you remember Land Before Time? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. She used to call me Ducky because I was like, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Your favorite hilarious. color is my favorite color. Your favorite number is my favorite number. Do you like me yet? Yeah, you know? right. Um, and I-, I called her Sarah because her name is actually Sarah. But there was this tr- like cranky triceratops that like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was our dynamic. That's really funny. And so, yeah, she. I became this crazy overachiever kind of seeking her attention and affection, not realizing it was causing competition for her that I wasn't even aware of. Hmm. And my parents were just like, are you coming home today? Right. Like I was yeah. just doing so many extracurricular that. Right. That's so interesting. The dynamic it's like, it's such a, it, it's, it's crazy to me always looking at the sibling dynamic uh, because I find it, I find it so interesting that the personality can drive that much of, yeah. of how you end up in life. Yeah. Cause you grow up same household, you yeah. know, unless you're like a decade plus apart, you're growing up with basically the same parents. You know what I mean? Right. Cause obviously the further you go, right. the more your parents can change over time, but the same version of your parents. Yeah. Own journey. Right. Right. And the way that they raised you was probably very similar, same household, same values, same, you know, structure. And then you can end up comp- like on totally separate pages and, and doing wildly different things. Yeah. That's always so fascinating to me is why I asked the question. So you are uh, super entrepreneurial growing up was uh, college in your household, like a non-negotiable, like you have to go to college and you have to get good grades. Was that always something that was on the table for you, for, uh, for you guys? So I wouldn't say a non-negotiable. I think that, you know, my parents are New Yorkers true New Yorkers. Um, I grew up in Massachusetts. They were basically first generation. Their parents all came through Ellis Island, immigrant family. Um, from where? I mean, uh, Germany and like Russia, Poland. Okay. And so I think like for them and new England mentality, the things that we value as a, a region is like family values, education, work ethic, Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a non-negotiable in terms of like, you have to get good grades. You're going to be jailed or grounded if sure, you don't. Sure. Um, I, I grew up in a really small suburban kind of Roman Irish Catholic town and was sort of a, not a black sheep, but a bit of a unicorn in not being named Christine or Katie. <laughs> and um, so I think it was just always an assumption, not necessarily an expectation or requirement. Okay. But I was a super nerd. Like I loved okay. education. I thought I was going to yeah. get a PhD. Like that's it was super interesting. That's super interesting. That's why I asked that because, like, I, I typically, if you're really entrepreneurial, you tend to shy away from, right. you know, the the academic, you know, traditional path of schooling or whatever. Right. So it seems it seems like that was something that even more fueled your entrepreneurship was the formal education and yeah. taking that into the kind of enterprise that you yeah. were always involved in. So I, I think that for me, I've always, I was never big on like routine and rigidity or structure. So it was not that I wanted like the institution of academia, Yeah, but I love learning. And my mom was a teacher and my dad actually prior to his social work was a teacher. Mm. And I come from multi-generational, um, community leaders. So on my mom's side alone, there's pastors and rabbis dating back Mm. many, many generations and freedom fighters in my daughter of the American revolution, the civil war, like what I believe was the right side of history, whatever that means Mm -hmm. along the way, Mm -hmm. but a lot of educators. And so it was less about going to school and more of what cheat codes can I get to hijack and hack learning so Mm -hmm. that I can accelerate the process including networking. So my sister, on the other hand, did not go straight to college. She went to Israel, lived on a kibbutz. We didn't know if she was ever coming home. Wow. A year later, went to school, um, graduated, and then continued her journey. But for me, I was early decision. Like yeah. I wanted to get right in. Yeah. But instead of going to UNC or any of these other really great schools, I went to University of Maryland because I knew I wanted to be in a metropolitan area and my network was going to be the most important thing. And so I didn't go to college for school. I went because it was a D1 university and I thought I wanted to be in sports journalism. Mm. I went because 
it was DC. And I knew that coming from a really small town in suburban Massachusetts, I wouldn't grow or learn if I stayed there. Yeah. And I went because I knew that my relationships would be what catapulted me. And so I actually graduated early. Some days I'm like, I don't know if I should have. That was really fun. I did really good with the whole like college thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I went from like vice president of Permanum, the honor society, doing all the volunteer work and like tutoring the athletes to semi illegally throwing club parties for <laughs> all of the celebrities when they came to town. Yeah. Um, so I had a really diverse experience. I actually had a radio show um, in college and I just did all the things, graduated early and kept it pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a. Uh overall experience something that you look back on and would recommend to a lot of other people in terms of like i just think there's a lot there's a lot of conversations being had now I, you know yeah. our, our parents generation was a little bit different where it was like if there was a clear path it was like if you do go to college and you do get a degree right. you will statistically have a much right. better chance of succeeding and now i feel like it that is not necessarily true anymore yeah. with rising you know cost yeah. of college degrees and then the fact that almost everybody has one entering into the you know career field right. and you know salaries are down schooling is up debt is high yeah. and it's no longer like the common and all these tech companies are even saying like oh you don't have to have a college degree to work right. here uh what, what are your thoughts on that on college as a whole and in terms of like specifically related to how your experience was i think that's a really good question i think it's a really timely question because popular or unpopular opinion, I'll give a bit of a controversial answer because it's somewhat hypocritical. For me, I would do it a hundred times over. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best decisions of my life, one of the best experiences of my life. I'm a very proud Terrapin. Like I loved Maryland. I am proud of like what Kevin Plank has done with Under Armour. I'm proud that, you know, uh, Jim Henson and the Muppets came out of there, right? Like yeah. there's a, the guy that founded Oculus. Yeah, yeah. Went, right? Okay. So like there's a level of Loyalty, Affinity, or, loyalty, yeah, family almost. Yeah. Um, and the best relationships of my life and some of my childhood relationships, my college relationships, my friendships that ground me and really shaped me in a lot of ways came through and from and by that experience. Mm. Do I think it is required to get a salaried position? No. And why I say somewhat controversial is like, I'm obviously, I won't, well, maybe not obviously, but I'm very involved in Web3 and transmedia as well, right? And to me, it's just iteration of the internet. Hmm. I don't look at it as isolated or independent. I don't look at it as hype or siloed. I look at it as technology servicing an economy and an ecosystem that allows for culture and commerce to collide, right? Yeah. And community. So when I look at the decentralization of things, it's institutions, it's corporate America, mm -hmm. it's academics, yeah. it's marriage, and a lot of things that have really shape-shifted in our generation, and we're watching the world change yeah. right before our eyes. So when you ask, is college for everyone, or would I recommend it? I think it's incredibly personal for a couple reasons. One is financial, and you know, I was fortunate to have like some help, get loans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. honestly have been working my whole life, so yeah, like, right. I... If I did not have the luxury, and we were very like middle class, we were not affluent. Yeah. But going to an out of state state school, it, it was not not a cost, right? Sure, sure. Um, but that was also a deterrent as to why I didn't go for MBA and then PhD and all of these things that. Yeah. Growing up, no one put it on me, but I wanted to be. Yeah. Again, yeah. learning was so important to me. I thought I needed all of these like right. badges of honor and certificates. This proves that you it. learned something. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so. I think your why is always the most important driving force. Mm. So for me, yes, it was the right decision and it was the right college. I might not have said that if it wasn't the right university sure. choice yeah. or city choice even, right? Yeah. DC was a really big part of my life to where when people asked where I was from, I would forget mass. I would be like, Massachusetts. Like I would forget because <laughs> it was such formative years. Yeah, right? yeah. And I never really identified with Boston because while I love the city and where I come from, it is this like hyper educated, hyper liberal, apparently very progressive mm. OG city, but it's actually pretty racist and compartmentalized when you break down mm. how the communities operate in the actual city, mm. which I don't align with, which is why I love New York, which is why I love DC, even LA. Well, it's very um, cut up. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of everything, right? Oh, yeah. Um, but to summarize, I think because there's a decentralization and deinstitutionalization, I don't think it is the right financial decision for most people. Yeah. I also think that we as a society and as shepherds of the space 
owe more alternative education systems because the problem is a lot of people then glorify not going to college that are not enterprising or entrepreneurial or don't have the tools or resources. Totally, yeah. And then they're just stuck. Right. And so right. the skills that I learned in college had nothing to do with communication studies or minoring in socio-behavioral or English or Spanish or Edward Bernays PR to understand the psychology of marketing. It was the community I built. It yeah. was the life skills I built. It totally. was the independence that I fostered. So a lot of my journey now, both within the industries that I've existed in across seven different categories of culture and in my new endeavor is actually very rooted in education, mm. but it's in revolutionizing education in ways that also service our learning styles because most people don't learn in the format 100%, yeah. that school gives us. But I don't think most um, leaders and educators or professors actually understand how to do situational education the way we learn situational leadership. Totally. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. I, really, the answer is just, just it's nuanced. Yeah. Yeah, it's like every every situation is going to be different. It depends on what you want to do. It depends on where you're going to go. Yeah. You know, it's just that the... I think the I think that at this point we've basically blown up the old school narrative of like you cannot achieve this no without Literally yeah the old right <laughs> right right literally and 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 so now it's become more of like a no pretty much you can do whatever you want to do yeah. at this point like unless you want to be a doctor or a lawyer like you can do it without a do right. without a degree you know what I mean and obviously a few other right. you know segments of of it's a nice studies path. sure yeah um, but then I think the intention and what you said I thought was really uh, important. And, I, and if I ever went that path, it definitely would have been the most top of mind for me, which is the relationships. Right. Um, because when you go to a, a place like that, where there's actual things happening, you know, and you're not just going right. to like the local community college to right. like get your AA, you know, right. it's just like, what, like, what are you doing this for? What's right. the intention? What's the purpose behind it? Cause going out of state to a different school in a right. big area and meeting all these people, you know, like how many of those people have you done business with? Have you worked with, have right. you had community with outside of the the realm of just going to college with them? You know what I mean? Well, and I would just add to that, that, um, there's vocational skill sets too, right? So like there are trades that you need to go learn, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be at an, a university or an Ivy league. Sure. So it's where do we access academia and education right. and legitimate information? Yeah. Because previously, the disparity in access to education information or wealth for especially, you know, gender equity, diversity, socioeconomics was access, like actual, like you had to have a certain level of, uh, you know, wealth to even have a computer to right, Google things, right, right? Right. And so now I think we're in the attention economy where there's such a saturation of information that- yeah it's not that there's not enough access to learn or information. It's that it's not curated or filtered mm. or vetted. Yeah. So we don't know the quality of what we're learning because Wikipedia is not where you're going to get your makeshift degree. Sure. You know? Sure. Um, okay. So kind of entering back into the story of the timeline here. So you go to school, mm -hmm. great experience. You're pushing, you're doing a dozen different things and doing them all well. What do you do directly after school? <laughs> I'm just, I'm laughing because there's no like normal answers to any of this. <laughs> like I had a really unique. Uh, somebody tells uh, me we wouldn't be having a conversation if you yeah. had normal answers. To I was everything. like, well, I went and got a job. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in school, I also stacked like 21 credits on two days because I had three jobs. So I was working for the Redskins when they were still the Redskins. Yeah. Very Googleable. Um, <laughs> I also was working for the NFL Players Association and Players Inc. So I was writing for NFL.com. I was in the marketing department. I had incredible mentors. Um, this is all during college. All during college. I worked three days a week in DC and went to school two days a week. And then nights I was throwing parties in <laughs> DC and like going volunteering downtown. So really underachieving, really. Yeah, I slept, <laughs> slept a ton. A ton. Yeah. Um, but I really lived a lot of lives in that period. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I thought I actually wanted to do like sports journalism. And I remember Mike Wilbon, who's pretty prolific in sports, um, was a really great mentor during that phase. And I remember thinking I wanted to be like a talking head, like do sports journalism and media. Um, and I'll never forget both in college and then just a couple of years ago, a recent conversation we had after he had rest in peace done a Kobe interview downtown. Um, we used to meet up for hot chocolate. He doesn't drink it, like it would be like in between different things. We would have like hot chocolate meetings yeah, <laughs> in like whatever season, whatever city. 
And he said the same thing to me that he had said back in college, which was, you care too much about everything. And I took it really personally initially mm. because I thought he was telling me that I wouldn't be a good broadcaster. Mm. And he was telling me the reason he's a great broadcaster is the only thing he cares about sure. is the sound yeah. bite. Yeah. He was like, you have so many questions. He's like, you ask me questions I don't even think to think about. Yeah. I think about where's my seat? What am I asking? Maybe who's in the chair? <laughs> yeah, right? sure. I want to get the best content and I need it to be successful, go viral, whatever it is, be great for what it is. And he used to write for the Washington Post as well. Mm. But it was always about the content only. Yeah. And he always told me I thought like a producer because I cared so much about the life cycle. Like what happened before? What happens after? How did we get here? What are the, like, what's the story? How are we storytelling? Are we story selling? Like what's the intent? And he would just be like, who needs to know any of this? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so I had to really think and, and receive that and be like, okay, maybe I don't want to go directly into being a talking head. Maybe yeah. I want to build brands. And so I graduated early in December, I think it was 2006. And, um, I spent six months. Well, we'll censor that part. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent six months funding my way to experiences. So I would take odd jobs, marketing, PR, press releases, um, filling in for managers that couldn't make it out to handle the talent or clients at Super Bowl, Sundance, All Star Weekend, Oscars, Grammys. I literally did the entire event circuit mm. and festival circuit that year. And I had amazing relationships and I didn't consider it networking. It was truly net worthing because there was no agenda. There was no intention. Mm. There was only attention. And I love people and I love stories like you and, mm -hmm. and, I feel very grateful for being able to learn from the best and ask questions to those that it's almost like being an expert in experts or hacking knowledge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I didn't ever think about it as what can you do for me or will I get a job out of this? It was just yeah. probably really could have been much more strategic, but it yeah. wasn't, it was genuine. And I think that's why this many years later, those same relationships are still just as fresh and fostered. Sure because it has been a culmination of really curating and cultivating, not expecting or requiring anything. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about it all the time and call it engineering serendipity. You know, mm. it's like I love that. it's serendipities, you know, by definition unengineerable, yeah, but yeah. if you get around really great people with that type of a mentality, like yeah. a service first, giving first mentality. Yeah. So there's so many people that especially in, that have high positions or, or, or whose time is in high demand they are so used to so many people wanting everything from them right. that just to be with somebody who's just like, what can I do? Like, how, how do I, how do I add something to, to your life is just like a breath of fresh air for them. Yeah. And to your point, like this guy that's sitting down with you, it's a broadcast journalist that a lot of people would like pay for his time. Yeah. You sit down with them and get a hot chocolate whenever you're in the same city, because right. obviously there was like something about you that enriched his life a little bit further. There was like that some value that he yeah. pulled from the conversations, even if it was just like somebody that I can share my lifetime of knowledge with that I've gained over a successful career that is actually going to implement it and see positive change in their life. Right. You know, cause that's the conversation I have with so many people where it's like, if you're struggling to find a mentor, you're probably not putting yourself in the right position. You're probably not somebody that's adding enough value and you're probably right. just not asking the right questions or, or, or putting yourself in the right situations. Right. Um, cause if all of those things were true, like successful people want to yeah. help other people. Yeah. And, and I think this is a kind of a direct, we talk about this all the time with, um, Hollywood makes you think that, rich people and people with a lot of money and successful people are all a bunch of arrogant assholes mm -hmm. who are like unethical and clearly screwed everybody over in their life to get where they are. And my experience has always been completely the opposite of that. And are there right. some assholes? Yes, of course. But most, most of the people that I know that are in that position is because they've worked really, really hard to put right. themselves in that position and they've lived a life that is actually very rigid in the right. terms of their value structure and how they go throughout doing, you know, their, their day to day lives. So, they appear to be mean to some people because those people don't respect their time. And the one thing that's the most important thing to the most successful people in the world is their time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so like, if you're going to waste their time, that's like stealing from like, that's literally like Absolutely. reaching into their wallet and taking money out, except worse because they don't care about that because they right. can go make more money tomorrow. They're not worried about right. that. They want time. And so like, if you go to these people and you waste their time, that's, 
it's stealing from them, you yeah. know? And so like, if you're somebody that will not waste their time and you'll be the opposite of that and you'll come in and like, you get a little bit of their time and you go implement it and you come right. back and you're like, look, I did this thing. And they're like, Multiply Oh, great. Cool. Like let's grab another hot chocolate sometime. Right. You know what I mean? It's just like you, you, if you're, if you're having, if you're struggling finding mentors, I think that it's just, you're not putting yourself in the right position. You're not talking to the right people. You're not asking the right questions. And then you're not finding a way to make sure that you're not going to waste their time. You know, you're not implementing what they tell you. Brilliantly put. And I think there's a lot to unpack in that. I think three really quick points, but like one, I agree completely. It's knowing the right questions, but there's really only two that matter. How can Mm. I help? How did you do it? Mm. Right. Because at the end of the day, you're right. People, even arrogant, narcissistic people want to share because it's what they've accomplished. All have a desire for impact or legacy. Yeah. And it's limited because of time, but time is currency. Mm -hmm. And so if it's transactional, which it is because it's also Mm man-made, right? So Mm -hmm. to me, time is just the contracts we have agreeing what time it is Mm -hmm. because we Mm -hmm. just dark out right now, right? Like we just set back time. Right. So if time was not fluid, we wouldn't have different time zones, et cetera. It's literally man-made. So it's we as humans deciding this is how we define how we manage the systems of our life, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's an operating system. Yeah. And so it's always going to be spent, but is it multiplied or divided? Mm. And so if it is spent as an investment, it's valuable, just like any dollar. Mm-hmm. If it's spent as an expense or like even spendthrift, right? Mm-hmm. It's a cost. Yeah. And so if you have a cost, you don't get anything back from that. There's a transaction for the thing that you got. If it's an investment, more comes out of it over time. Sure. And so then time actually multiplies and becomes more efficient. And you also said something really important to me, which is what you have witnessed in certain circles, right? But I think that's also a reflection of you. And the reason I say that is I've seen it all, right? Like I've been in entertainment marketing for 15 years. Yeah. I have met anyone you've probably ever Googled, Yeah. right? Yeah. For better and for worse. But what I've also witnessed is those that have the worst reputations validly have not so great reputations. I don't always get that side of them. Hmm. I've witnessed it. I've observed it. But I believe that we also compel behavior Mm -hmm. and that we create evidence of what we believe about ourselves and others. Totally. And so if you're an asshole, you're going to be an asshole whether I'm in the room or not. Mm -hmm. But if I witness you being an asshole to me, there's something in me that validates it Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. believes that I deserve that in some way. Right. Sure. Yeah. Whereas that same person has different versions and faces that they show up for people. And it says a lot more about you that that's what you've experienced. And I would like to think that I've experienced then, you know, people don't realize when they're getting a lot of victim complex in their careers. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so-and-so didn't pay me or I didn't get this job or so-and-so won't make the time for me because I didn't ask the right question. That chip on the shoulder, that lack of gratitude, that attention on devastation or lack or loss instead of appreciation for what you do have or the access or the impact is what is creating a snowball effect of lack. Sure. And I think because you were able to create experiences and evidence that you are worthy or they are giving you and you are worth their time or someone, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're affirming positive beliefs and expansive beliefs about yourself every time. Whereas a lot of people are actually just playing out their own trauma. They're playing totally, out yeah. their own lack of enoughness. It, it's easier for them to assume that they're just being an asshole because they know right. deep down that if they were them, they would be an asshole. Possibly. You know what I Possibly. mean? Like they're, they're right. like projecting this idea of who they would be if they were in right. their position. And so it's easy for them just to write it off and be like, ah, oh, well, I'll sure. probably be the same way. So whatever, but still they, you know, have them. or even internalize and project of like, they're being an asshole to me because I am smaller than them. I don't have as much money. I don't have as much right. success. I don't have, it's a, a, a lot of times it comes down to childhood worth issues. Totally. Yeah. And identity, you know? Yeah. 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 It's definitely, it's definitely one of those things that, that has been most apparent to me in terms yeah. of like connecting with people that again, whose time is just very in demand. And, yeah. and to me, that's the game of life. You yeah. know, like to your point earlier, you said something about, um, you always wanted to accelerate success. Mm-hmm. Like that's, we, we, uh, our agency is called fast pass, um, media because we, that's like the entire 
the entire premise behind building successful relationships with people who've done what you want to do a million times over and on a higher level than you even think you're capable of is when you meet those people, it's like, it's like they're at the front of the line in Disneyland, you know what I mean? And you're in the back and you're just like walking (laughs) up through all the line of people. Cause I was like, it's, it's not like you can, (laughs) yeah, you you can't like snap your fingers and get to the front of the line. Like you're, you're, it's, it's the person that everybody hates because they're walking by them. You know what I mean? And sure. it's like, Oh, my buddy's right there. And they're like walking past her, but yeah. like they, you, you check to make sure that yeah. they do have a buddy up there. It's like, all right, sure. And it's you let them pass. Friend. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's how, that's how I, I picture it. Cause like you still have to walk the steps. It's just that yeah. you're going faster than everybody else. It's like you're in another lane. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because everybody else is waiting their turn in line and you had somebody at the front that's like, here's how you do it. Here's where to step and you can come up here with me. Right. You know what I mean? And so if you can't figure out a way to make sure that people like that view you as a valuable person to spend time with, um, then you're going to be stuck in the line yeah. and, and waiting for your turn or waiting for life to drop something in your lap instead of you going out and making it happen for yourself. Right. And you said it before, it's like in engineering serendipity, right? Yeah. So the engineering part is there are no shortcuts. There is absolutely no substitute for life experience. However, when we talk about expertise or mm. the outlier effect and the 10,000 hours, the 10,000 hours could be 8,000, could be 7,000 mm. if you have the cheat codes because right. you're going to the source of expertise and you're accelerating and expediting the process. Right. I don't believe in shortcuts. I don't believe that we actually get to cut the line. Like there's a, you know, you got to know someone there, right? Sure. Sure. But how do we create options and opportunities for people to fast track again, learning and earning and understanding yeah. to be able to move more efficiently because of those 10,000 hours, if you're burning and wasting a significant amount of them, that's not practice. Right. That's exactly. Totally. Waste. You do have to have an increased level of competence along yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. can't, you can't <laughs> yeah, just exactly. show up. Well, I tell people is like, if you get around really, really high quality, successful people, they'll force you to level up or they'll force you to get out. Yeah. Like there's no in between. Like yeah. you can't just there's be, no you can't be the weight on a bunch of people who are, you know, flying. It's yeah. like, they're just going to, they're just going to cut the rope yeah. at some point. You know, it's like you either got to learn how to fly or like you're done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it, it really puts you in, as a person. If you put yourself in a position like that, it's really one of those times where it's like, well, what are you going to do? You know, are are you going to level up? Are you going to, you know, are you going to learn from these people and allow that to turn you into a different version of yourself that can hang in these circles? Or are you just going to eventually be phased out of all the relationships because you were never able to actually do anything because like just getting in the room isn't the equation. It's like, you got to get in the room and then you got to do something about it. Like you're going to still have to take some action. (laughs) You're still going to have to learn. You're still gonna have to grow. You're still gonna have to, you know, apply what you're learning from these people and persist. It's not easy, right? Right. Like talk about coal becoming diamonds through heat and pressure. Yeah. Can you sustain that heat and pressure to break through or are you going to stay rocks? Right. Like that's, I mean, not an old, not a new idea. It's just really understanding your why. So let's talk about the businesses that you're running. Cause I I know you have your hands in so many different things. Um, so tell me it articulate to me from your perspective, when in your career you would look back and go like that was a, a really big breakthrough for me this yeah. like this one time where this this particular business or this particular thing that we did like this yeah. is a big breakthrough so between moving to LA and doing the celebrity events company and moving to New York to lead culture and partnerships for a liquor company I had a lot of jobs across a lot of verticals of culture and industry so i always consider myself category agnostic because I believe that my skill set is innovation and branding. At the core, it's how do you build brands? How do you tell stories? How do you build community across platforms, across categories, across culture? And I worked at agencies. I worked at startups. I was in fashion. I was in music. I actually was an executive recruiter for a headhunter for a period, scaled the business almost 300% in three and a half years, but was doing, you know, career coaching with executives that I secretly would have loved to give my resume to and like was probably in like blink twice yeah, yeah, Stockholm yeah. syndrome because it was a pretty toxic work environment. Yeah. And while I would not wish that on anyone and I barely got out alive, it also accelerated my growth because I had to grow up so fast professionally. Yeah. Yeah. And I was so innocent and so naive and so gentle, honestly, at the time and sort yeah. of earnest 
that I had to really toughen up and it really mm. thickened my skin to be able to work in very male dominated industries sure. in, you know, statistically misogynistic or, um, difficult yeah. industries and in places that I was not the majority 90% of the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so what was really interesting was in doing the executive recruiting, I actually had the opportunity to not only network and build relationships because I was interviewing the best in class VP and up C-suite executives and every, I mean, I worked with Yahoo and Amazon and Westfield and Nike and Gap. And I was doing trainings with 200 HR executives that I secretly was like, take my resume now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but I realized how humbling of an experience it was because I had never been starstruck. I had never really revered celebrity because it's not how I grew up. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that you're amazing at what you do. Sure. But it never excited me to meet someone that was like famous. Yeah. yeah. My version of starstruck was you did what, where you were the CMO or CEO of, you know, Nike or Starbucks right, right. or the, the CMOs of the biggest companies in the world were where I was like, nervous to talk to you because they were my yeah. idols. Right. Yeah. And two things I learned in executive recruiting were one, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> and two, no one knows what they're doing. Yeah. And it was the best thing you could ever learn about anything because I'm talking to these people that I worshiped at the time that their bonuses were bigger than my salary that couldn't articulate to me what they did day to day that couldn't demonstrate or explain to me the win or when they were winning or losing. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't even understand how they were delegating or automating necessarily. They right. just were sort of on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, it was really disheartening and disillusioning because sure. it was, you know, these people that I thought I was aspiring to, right, right? Not all, but many. Yeah. And on the other hand, it was so incredibly empowering because I've never been daunted since. There's mm, actually yeah, no right. room I can go into where someone, because of their title or their education or their, you know, wealth, intimidates me mm -hmm. because I'm like, I know inside you're just a scared little girl or boy, yeah, <laughs> right? Right. Like, right. Everyone wants the same things. They want to get home earlier for their wife, kids, family, or downtime. Mm -hmm. They want to get their boss off their back. Everyone has a boss, whether you're independent or corporate, whether you're servicing your clients or your actual boss. Everyone has someone that they're servicing. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to your kid's soccer game on a Sunday or yeah, get yeah. to go to that dinner and make your boss's job simpler mm -hmm. and drive the bottom line of the company? Everything else, I don't care if it was an engineer, a head of sales, a CMO, a head of technology, no matter what the role was, it was the same needs because Maslow's hierarchy of needs doesn't change in corporations. Right, right. So the idea of like physiological needs, safety and security, love and affection, blah, 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 up mm -hmm. to self-actualization is personal and professional. And so the reason people go to corporate America is in part that safety and security our parents' pension plans or, sure. you know, guarantees. But how guaranteed is a corporate job if it's at will right. any more than a contract as an entrepreneur? Right. So it was really incredibly interesting. The difference is one of them teaches you how to hunt and yes. like go create another yes. opportunity again. Yes. Yeah. And you asked me what was one of the biggest game changers in my career when I yeah. had a really big breakthrough. And ironically, it was the opposite. So I didn't need to learn how to hunt. I didn't need to learn how to innovate. I didn't need to learn how to build brands in the sense that that was it, my hard wiring. I would not wish being an entrepreneur on anyone. I would love to love complacency. I promise you that is not a line. Sign me up. I would love <laughs> to be satisfied <laughs> by all the time. life. Yep. I'm not. Yep. It's not who I am. It's not who I will ever be. Yep. But what I did need to learn was how do you learn the codes to break them? How do you learn the rules to break them? And so what I had not done was infuse and integrate structure up until that point. And so going to Diageo and going to corporate America, all of the things I hated about it are the same things that I loved and took from it, which were the importance of routine mm. and operations and administration and all of the things that drove me crazy. And I probably drove my peers and bosses crazy because <laughs> I was like a radical <laughs> renegade and disruptor yeah. in a very status quo organization. 
Um, I was on a very nimble team where that particular team really valued disruption and, mm. and culture. Um, but within the bigger ecosystem of the belly of the beast, there's no corporation in the world that prefers change to, you know, sure. not change. Sure. Um, but I couldn't have been a CEO of a venture backed startup. I couldn't have started my own agency and I certainly couldn't be developing the company I am now yeah. if I hadn't learned how to build. I knew how to hire and build teams. I knew how to create products. I knew how to sell and tell stories. Yeah. I didn't know infrastructure. I didn't know tax law. I didn't know the legalese and how to protect or FTC versus FTA. Right, right, right. And I certainly didn't know like if my dad wasn't on my back about IRS and taxes, I probably would have gone bankrupt multiple times over, right? <laughs> yeah. Because we glorify ownership and we glorify entrepreneurship. And I am guilty of that. Totally. I love it. I think it's so important. Equity matters, but it's not for everyone. Yeah. And a lot of times we call freelancing or independent artistry entrepreneurship. Yeah. There is no infrastructure. There is no sustainability. So solopreneurship. Exactly. Yeah, it's much, much different. Right. And it, and it's not something that can actually empower people always, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But being a freelancer doesn't necessarily empower the same opportunities that entrepreneurship does. Right. If you are able to monetize your mission or profit from your passion or really create commerce around the things that you love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm always shouting from the rooftops that if more people had the privilege and luxury to do what they love, if not world peace, we would at least have happier colleagues. Absolutely. Absolutely. And less road rage. Yes, definitely <laughs> yeah. less road rage. <laughs> um, okay. So you worked a lot in corporate, yeah. held a ton of different jobs, a ton of different positions. Um, but now you have, you have a, a female led gaming company, correct? And then you have the loop studios and then you said you're working on a couple of other projects or everything's yeah. culminated to something coming up yeah. very soon. So, so the, I'd love to hear the, the, the perfect bridge. summary of the last couple of years. Okay. Um, but yes, I partnered to start the first diverse women's gaming collective. We raised a few million dollars. I was one of the only venture backed women CEOs in gaming in that capacity, mm -hmm. which I didn't know going into it because it's 2020 at the time. And I almost said 2022. It's 2020 at the time. And like, that sounds ridiculous. Yeah, um, yeah. But the goal was to really shape shift an industry in a way that would push for culture and diversity and gender equity mm -hmm. because gaming is 49% women and no one was talking to them or paying them. That is a surprising 49%. statistic to me. Wow. That is surprising. Higher to me. globally for mobile and skewed even more um, female in Asia. Wow. And that's just self-identity. And you have to remember, women also don't often identify as gamers if they're not like a sweaty basement gamer. Sure, right? sure, yeah. And so I didn't even feel like, I felt like a fraud and imposter complex at first because I had beat yeah. Mortal Kombat and like yeah, Mario right, Kart, maybe right. a little Yoshi here and there. <laughs> uh, you know, tear up some Tetris, but I didn't consider mobile games games. Yeah. I didn't consider my parents thinking I was going to be a city planner because they couldn't get me to dinner because I was on SimCity all the time mm. and trying to build infrastructures for yeah. society. <laughs> As a gamer. Right? Yeah. And so I really had a skewed view and I looked at it as cult culture and building community and all of that. But it really took a long time for me to realize, oh, I'm actually in gaming and a gamer too. Yeah. My mom plays Wheel of Fortune on her iPad every day. She's a gamer. Mm. So it's how do you define these things to allow for more identity and belonging and access to entry? So with that, I also had launched Loop. Loop is a change agency. It's all women led and operated. My business partner, who is now CEO as of a year and a half ago, had an incredible background in serial entrepreneurship and really finding white space and gaps in different aspects of culture, um, but had worked a lot in Black Hollywood and PR and events. And so when we were really restructuring, I didn't want it to be bound by my billable hour anymore. Hmm. And so much of it, you know, Loop was actually a DBA from First Mind Media and Marketing that incorporated 2012. Gotcha. And so up until 2019, it was a side hustle. It was a consultancy. It was a freelance. It was technically an entrepreneurial LLC. Hmm. Certainly have tax write-ups to prove it. Sure, sure. <laughs> but I didn't look to build an empire or a team. It was just how I made money selling my brain. Got it. And when I partnered with Antoinette and she and I really built out 
the brand of Loop yeah. and the team being this diverse women's change yeah. agency, it was how do we go beyond just the strategy work to strategic marketing, PR, experiential events, but also social media and influencer marketing in ways yeah. that crack the code and play a little bit of a Trojan horse or Robin Hood where you're getting the big corporate dollars to allocate into community and culture to, to demonstrate that diversity is lucrative. Yeah. And then with cool startups, how do you help them start off and start up properly working with everyone from Activision Blizzard and launching the Call of Duty League um, to some brands at Diageo and other liquors like Lobo 1707 with LeBron James or the first you know, men's company that DJ Khaled launched, whether it was celebrity or corporation or just really cool creatives with startups, it was about transformative change. Mm. And that's why it was a change agency versus a marketing agency, um, or is rather. For me right now, everything that we just spoke about around education and acumen for entrepreneurs is what led to, as an extension of Loop, launching Lucid Vision. And okay. Lucid Vision, at its core, is a media company because there's going to be podcasts and books and development and all of the things that are, how do you tell stories? Awesome. Um, but the core offering is truly ed tech. And so okay. what is the academic platform to create a creator accelerator? And I truly believe, as I said, if you can expedite learning, you can expedite earning, mm. but it's very hard to biohack that if you don't listen and learn learning. And so through AI and machine learning and technology in what's being developed into kind of an app and platform, think like if Duolingo um, was for entrepreneurs and you okay. had an executive MBA. Um, so one thing, let me say that a different way. Lucid Vision is ed tech at its core. It's a media company with, mo with excuse me, run it back. <laughs> yeah. First day with my new mouth. <laughs> As an extension of Loop, I'm launching Lucid Vision, which at its core is a media company. But the offering is really ed tech because I truly believe that if you can accelerate learning, you can accelerate earning. And we talk about as children, you might be audio or visual or haptic, but only as children do we actually service our learning styles. Mm. As we get older and we get into school and academia, it's one way to learn. It's books, it's seminars, it's things that most entrepreneurs and creatives actually don't flourish in, mm -hmm. much less survive or thrive, yeah. right? And so through AI, through machine learning, through digitizing the academic experience, I've come up with a process that I think can really help accelerate um, the way that we learn mm. and be very nimble to your performance when you need more video, when you need more audio, and really being an expert in experts of curating curriculum that is with the best of the best, which as we talked about earlier, is one of the only ways to go directly to the source and think mastermind and masterclass. Yeah, yeah. This is serving in between TikToks and TED Talks. And between that TikTok and TED Talk is short form content and education. It's not that you don't get the full curriculum. It's that you can get it broken down and served to you in ways that you can actually retain it and apply mm. it. And it's tiered so that you might need a 101 course in one thing and the executive might need a 401 course in another. But when you look at these masterminds and courses, and I have a lot of friends with them and I think they're amazing, but I don't think that they, they're supplementary and complementary and great. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they service the gap if you're not going and getting that degree. Sure. And so yeah. how do you kind of digitize degrees? Mm. The dream is to have facilities and actual academic buildings okay. um, that would have workspace, performance space, shopping space, learning space. Um, but the starting point is digital. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. So this is all culminated in the last week, two weeks. So it's honestly, it's been probably six months in the making in terms of development. Okay. I'm in pre-production right now and actually... Um, this past week selected the tech partner and I'm starting to do the fundraising. Um, but I think that I had a download in this past week where I don't know if it was an epiphany or an existential crisis. <laughs> Time will tell. Yeah. Where I had this wake up moment of, wow, everything I've ever done led me to here. When I looked at 
being an executive recruiter as sort of like a random thing or at that time partnering to do a docu series with Bravo and NBC where I helped create a show about it mm-hmm. to having a radio show that was one of the top performing sports talk shows in college to skipping entire chapters of the career because we only have so much time winning a reality show for a six figure job with an Emmy award winning producer to learn producing, not as a PA, but then actually having to do the job and was the director of social media and marketing for the challenger brand to Equinox. Every single weird job I've had since I was a child fits into this in a squarely servicing way Hmm. that I couldn't have, I couldn't have engineered. Yeah. Um, but I would say it's actually 21 years in the making because the core of lucid vision is the content, right? Being able to give entrepreneurs an opportunity and and the mission in a lot of ways is how do you inspire and empower creators to realize their dreams, Hmm. right? But the asterisk for creators is if you have a, if you have an imagination, you're a creator. Yeah. I'm a creator. You're a creator. Executives, entrepreneurs, freelancers, artists, corporate executives, even who is not a creator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so when I say creator accelerator, I don't mean, you know, how do you create a digital funnel or make money off your Instagram? Right. I mean, how do you build entrepreneurship and education on running companies effectively for creatives that just want to create. Right. 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 If I could just get paid to go sit in a corner and create, I would love someone else to do all the paperwork. I promise you that. Totally. Yeah. But it's so, so, so important. And so back when I was 16, I created Leaders and Artists United for Change, which was the Launch Foundation and the Launch Fund. And I shit you not, I've been paying GoDaddy, shout out to GoDaddy, (laughs) if you want to give me any discounts at this point, um, for all of these domain names from the launchfoundation.com and .org to launch fund to when I was doing, um, I wanted to do Tinder for um, basically matchmaking jobs and creators. Yeah. And I had funding uh, lined up. I had met with Jonathan Bedeen, who was the CTO and founder of Tinder, to understand swipe technology. But at that moment, <clears throat> LinkedIn announced um, a recommendation engine in beta, and I thought they had figured out my mm, idea. Yeah, and I was like, "Hi, Goliath, David. Yeah, this right. is a waste of my time, right? Right. I still have gig getter and getagig dot com. <laughs> 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 so my point is, all these things kind of culminate, but within the next three months. Launch Foundation will be approved as a 501c3. The Launch Fund is effectively a culture fund. And in the last month alone, I became an advisor on a half billion dollar fund that is giving me a lot of the experience to really understand how to develop that in a way that's more than just taking corporate dollars and helping creative entrepreneurs like I've done in my career, but actually build businesses in a portfolio. Mm. So it's just wild that like, the very first question you asked me was walk me through or talk to 11 year old Elisa. Yeah. 11 year old Elisa knew what she wanted to do a lot better than 21 year old Elisa or even 31 year old Elisa. Mm. And I think we spend most of our twenties figuring out who we are and most of our thirties finding who we were. And when I was in mm. college, I had a picture with a post-it and a thumbtack post-its don't really stick. Let's be honest <laughs> on the hutch of my dorm desk. And it was this, I have to find it. If I ever find this, I will send it to you. But it was this ridiculous picture where I'm like, you see the rhododendrons strewn everywhere. I destroyed the yard. And I'm like holding these rhododendrons. And I had this giant, almost like Kentucky Derby pink top hat to this hat on. And probably the only pink dress I ever owned. One jelly shoe, the other one somewhere in the yard. The knocked over kid's chair. A boa, not sure why or from where. (laughs) And I just have this shit-eating grin. And I'm like, you know, and yeah. I think I was around seven, maybe fi- five to seven. I looked five for like 10 years. So I don't know how old I was, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I, looked, I basically looked five until I was 20. <laughs> but um, I had so much joy in that photo. Mm. And I was such a ham. So all of the pictures of me, I'm either like hanging from a monkey bar like this or yeah, like, yeah. look like my legs are broken. I have so much attitude in all these pictures. But in this one, I'm just a happy kid. Yeah. And the post-it said, did you make her proud today? Because I don't have kids and I didn't have kids at the time. Obviously, I would still have kids. I mean, that was weird. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I I don't have children, but I looked at what would I want my daughter to look up to? Mm. And when I thought about my daughter, I thought about my inner child. Yeah. And so I've always looked at 
am I making my inner child proud? And it's honestly kept me really honest because it's been a moral compass. It's been, a totally an aspect yeah. of not only integrity and in decision making, but also what brings you joy? How yeah. do you bring back play? Yeah. So why did I get into liquor? I don't even drink that much. Yeah. I like selling celebration. I got mm. into sports because it was emotional marketing. I got into gaming because there was community. I got into web three because it was around this tribal affinity for the same things and yeah. how we wag me. Right. And so for me, I think, how do you gamify and play so that you can enrich and enlist that inner child, which is the base of art. It is the base of creative. It is the base of conversation and making friends and storytelling. Cause I definitely didn't get the memo. Don't talk to strangers. So <laughs> I love what you're doing because even shifting from the idea of like the value of the network yeah. to the value of relationship currency and yeah. capital is so important. And I think that goes back to your childhood self too, of like, I just want to go play outside with my friends. It's remarkable. Right. It's remarkable watching. I have, I have two little kids. My son is three and a half and my daughter will be two next week. And yeah? it is two. two. Yep. She and want to know yet? <laughs> she is a talker. Okay. She talks forever. It's crazy actually how much she says already, but she, uh, it's just crazy watching kids make friends. Yeah. It's remarkable. Yeah. Like you just go to a playground and then you see like my son will just go up to this other little kid and then they'll just like start running together. Right. It's as simple as that. Like it's trust? just like, I like trust. yeah, it's you just like, slides, like, I like, Hey, slides. we're both at this playground. <laughs> you don't want to play, yeah. you know, and it's just like, <laughs> it's just the, the innocence <laughs> is like, it, it's, it's yeah. a breath of fresh air. Yeah. There's, there's no judgment. There's no bias that like the world hasn't taught them to think a certain way yeah. about people or to come up with these prejudgments yeah. and, and you know, there's no, and, and then the opposite way is like to be really self-conscious and like, I don't, right. you know, what do they think of me? Like none of that exists. Right. It's just to learned. your point, pure innocence, joy, happiness, and, and, and it's in its most pure form. So and love. yeah, yeah. It speaks totally. to you as a parent as well though, because yeah. I believe we're born empty. We mm. are just God self creative potentiality mm. and love. And everything else we learn, whether it's kindness or insecurity, anger, hate, anything else, we are, we learn, mm -hmm. right? Like we are not innately evil. We are not innately hateful. We are not innately misogynistic or racist or bigoted or any of that. Mm -hmm. We learn these things to protect and preserve our own sense of self. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of hurt people, hurt people is so real mm -hmm. because it's defense mechanisms to protect and make sense of the world around you. And you as a parent have not taught your, excuse me, you as a parent have not taught your children those things, which is why they can go to a playground yeah, and yeah. talk to a kid that looks different than them mm -hmm. and make friends off the cuff Instantly. without wondering, are you going to screw me over? Are you going to hurt my feelings? Are you going to steal my toy? Right, right. Which as we get older, we have to unlearn. And I actually believe that so much of what we require is unlearning and reprogramming way more than anything we need to learn. Well, that is a perfect place to move into the final, final question here that I have for you. Um, the show's called Travis makes friends. And I kind of told you this pre recording, but essentially we figured out over 800 episodes of build your network that networking and making friends is basically the same activity. So I'm curious to hear from you um, as an adult. I feel like the more connected we are, the more disconnected we are, meaning like we have social media and we're super connected, but also like it makes for a ton of really shallow relationships, um, which are actually, in my opinion, like overall worse for your mental health if you don't have people that you can go deep with. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear a relationship, a friendship that you've made, yeah. business or otherwise, in the last three to five years as an adult. Yeah. Who, who is somebody that you've made friends with and how did you make friends with that person? So I think I have a lot of examples of that, but I think first of all, called me an adult, which is the first mistake. Um, <laughs> but as a child front adult, adult by age as only an aged yeah. child, yeah. As an elder child <laughs> yeah. um, I think that I'll take it macro and then I'll take it micro because I know it's a direct question, but yeah. beyond any one specific relationship, because I can give a couple really interesting examples for different reasons. I think at large, it is about 
shared values. Yeah. I think when we're younger, it's about shared interests and we talk about being like-minded. Sure. Right? And I think like-minded is good, but I look at what is like gold, what is like sold, what is like hearted because I don't really care if we're like-minded. Mm. I actually surround myself with the United Colors of Benetton racially, gender, ethnographically, socioeconomically. I like being around people that don't think like me because mm. I think I learn from them. I grow from them. They challenge me. I sure. have to think differently. So while I like like-minded people, I don't seek it. I actually seek people that share um, the same family values, mm. the same desire for legacy and social impact, the same enterprising mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, even if they're executives, it's a mentality. Here's sure. the thing. It's not about yeah. the role. It's choosing change versus status quo. Mm -hmm. And I really love passionate people. Yeah. So I find myself gravitating to people that are brutally honest, that are very secure and comfortable in their own skin and can be at home anywhere. I, I joke sometimes you can bring me from the trap house to the white house from Compton to Hamptons and there's no, you're going to get the same version of me in every sure. setting. And selfishly, I appreciate people that have that same quality because I exist in a lot of worlds professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. I want to know I can bring you anywhere. Right. Um, but I'll say this, the way you asked a process question, which is how I think how is showing up in places that, people may have common interests as a baseline yeah. because that has to do with where you spend your time. Sure. So sure. I do a lot of like boxing or hiking or yeah. things like masterminds and conferences. And I'm immersed in settings where it's people that may be in the same yeah. general lane. And then the vetting process is exactly. who are you as a person. Yeah, I think that like that's going to naturally be a higher concentration of people that have similar values by starting with like similar, you know, yeah. interests. It's yeah. like you start with a similar interest, but if you get a bunch of people who have very similar interests to you, you're, you have a higher hit rate on that yeah. percentage of people in that room that are yeah. also going to match you in terms of values and actually becoming somebody that you want to be I friends think it's with. It's the co or the vouch too, right? So like I've met some really amazing people through really amazing people. Totally. Totally. Cause there's also a lot of crazies out there. So <laughs> yeah. you might meet some interesting oh, characters, yeah. but yeah. like, I think, again, it's how do you accelerate the process? Mm. The expeditious way is to meet through someone. And so even female friends or relationships I've been in, the best that happened the fastest was usually because there was a connective tissue mm. or a third party totally. that had already kind of understood each of us to where you need to know each other. And a lot of times I get introduced because someone wants career advice or a brand sponsorship or something access to an event or a celebrity, but that doesn't always indicate who someone is. Everyone has similar needs. Yeah. And so I've had some really great relationships foster from just weird rogue introductions mm -hmm. um, or meeting at a party or an event or on the bus or, you know, you, I don't think the where matters. I do think, listen, like, there's a stronger likelihood if you are a spiritual religious person and you meet someone at church, you might have more in common than sure. someone you met at, say, Whole Foods. The bar. House, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Or right. if you meet someone at the bar. Same thing, right? right? But I think we forget that we're really robust people. And that same person that you meet on church, um, the same person you meet at church on a Sunday, you might also meet at the bar on a Friday. Sure. Right? Sure. The same person that is calling because they need tickets to the Grammys might also be the same person that is feeding the homeless with me on Sunday right. for a friend's birthday right. and cares. Not mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah. And I think allowing the nuances of people's character and complexity to lead instead of compartmentalizing for your own comfort, it's really, really key to that. Lisa, this is a lot of fun. Uh, before we take off here, uh, I want to, you know, get you back to your schedule. I know you have a lot of stuff going on. Um, where should people find you? Where should people connect with you? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks for letting me be one of your friends. Um, I love <laughs> it's official. Yeah. It's official. Yeah. Brunch. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, I really love it though. Honestly, before I answer that, I love the rebranding and Travis and friends because I really think that that matters. And I really think there's a huge difference between relationship building and networking and friend making. And I, I feel very fortunate. I always hashtag my friends are dope because I'm so grateful to be able to promote and applaud the incredible things that they're doing all the time. Mm. And I think you 
have a really amazing gravity and ability to magnetize not just great stories, but great people. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you want to find me, I'm at ginger Jacobs on basically every platform. It's at G I N G E R J A C O B S. If my spelling is correct. And, um, my agency is at loop says L O O P S A Y S. Perfect. It is, uh, really an incredible group of women. Um, and it's loopstudios.com, L O O P S T U D I O S.com. Perfect. So if you're listening, go check out some stuff from Elisa. I know, I know that you're going to find some amazing things on all of her social platforms. Cause I know that I do. So, um, at ginger Jacobs on all social go follow her, tell her what's up. Tell her you heard about her here on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you guys next time. Peace out.